If you have your Bibles, look at chapter 1, how God introduces him to his future. Verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. For you were born, I set you apart, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God knew all of us before we were born. <coughs> I was with a very fine minister this last weekend, been a missionary and one of my students in the 60s. And he said, if I hadn't met you, I don't know what my life would have been like. I said, listen, it was the Lord. He had his eye on you from before you were born. It's true of all of us. And you have it said here <coughs> to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And he's like Moses. He says, Sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. He's going to write one of the most famous books in history. And he says, look, I can't handle words. We must beware of making excuses if God has called us to do something. He can enable us to do what we're to do. Well, God gives him some encouragement. Look at verse 17 on. <clears throat> Get yourself ready. That sounds a bit scary. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I'll terrify you before them. Today I've made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests and the people of the land. They'll fight against you, they won't overcome you. I'm with you and will rescue you declares the Lord. Tradition says he was ultimately stoned, but we don't know for sure. And what we do know is he was rescued by providence time and time again from prison. That we know. But we also know that, like you and me, this prospect of fighting a whole nation was not very pleasing to human nature, and he's scared. Look at the 20th chapter. In the 20th chapter, it tells us about him being put in the stocks. And then it gives his reflections the morning after. Verse 2 talks about the wicked priest Pasha had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks. And Jeremiah makes a prophecy about that man's future, which was fulfilled. But beginning at verse 7, you have one of the most interesting passages in the Bible where a prophet of God complains to God about God. Look at it. Verse 7. Lord, you deceived me. You know, he's like Peter. Peter says to God on one occasion, Not so, Lord. You're not right, Lord. That's not right. Not so, Lord. Lord, he says, you've deceived me. I was deceived. You overpowered me and provided. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. The word of the Lord's only brought me insult, reproaches all day long. And if I say I won't mention God or speak any more in his name, your word in my heart is like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. That's one of the marks of any man or woman that God selects for public work. That regardless of what happens, they feel compelled to keep going. William Booth lasted into his 90s had all sorts of physical ailments. His wife had died of breast cancer decades before. If she'd still been alive, he'd have been in better health. She was always telling him how to eat and how not to eat and what to do. She was much smarter than Willie, much, much smarter. But she died in the 60s. Wonderful woman, the mother of the Salvation Army. 
you ladies, if you want inspiration, read biographies of Catherine Booth. But the old general couldn't stop preaching and so even though he's blind and deaf and all sorts of other problems, still in his 90s he's preaching till he topples into the grave. Calvin had every disease in the book. You name it, he had it. But Calvin spent every conscious hour proclaiming the word of God either verbally, orally, I've been in his church, or by mail, he's in contact with all the kings of Europe and all the great missionaries of Europe. Wesley is still walking to his distant churches to preach when he's 85 years old. Walks miles when he's 85 to preach. And so here's Jeremiah saying, well, look, Lord, you've really, you've really hurt me, you know, but I can't stop preaching your word. That's a great verse. If I say I won't mention him, his word in my heart's like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones and I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Report him, let's report him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying perhaps he'll be deceived, then we'll prevail. We'll take our revenge on him. Verse 11 is important. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. One reason I love this passage, it is so true to life. The men and women that God has wonderfully used through the ages have known experiences like this. We all know them. It would be very nice if you and I could always be on the mountaintop, but that's a bit inhuman, we're not. The thing to remember is it doesn't matter whether you're down or up, what matters is the direction you're travelling. It doesn't matter whether you're down or up, but it matters tremendously, tremendously where you are heading, what you're looking for. So this is a great insight. Here's a very human man, one of the greatest men who's ever lived, but he has his downs. And when he's down, he wonders whether God's asleep or doesn't care. But he comes out of it and says, Lord, you're with me like a mighty warrior and your word is a fire in my bones. Come back to chapter 12. This is somewhat similar. If you look at the last section of the previous verse, verse 21, therefore this is what the Lord says about the men of Anathoth, who was seeking your life. Now, Anathoth was like Nazareth to Jesus. Anathoth was his hometown. And this man, like Jesus, finds that his closest acquaintances, his fellow townsmen, turn against him, want to kill him. Not just throw tomatoes, they want to kill him. 